can tell you, having lived in the United States, why we have a Memorial Day. And the other issue is, of course, this propaganda that drives people to join the military. You know, that propaganda is done because people really believe that they're going to protect the homeland, despite all evidence to the contrary since Vietnam. Now, what's, if you really want to protect the country, your homeland, the fact of the matter is, you know, you want to join the police force, but there's no Memorial Day for the police. Well, the police officers that die, there's no Memorial Day for them. Not, there's no Memorial Holiday for them on the federal level. Now, as part of that makes sense because the police are local, they're not national, technically. Now they have unions that collaborate with each other that then create lobby for laws to be passed all over the United States. But technically, the whole point of having the police is that they're local. But there's still no local holidays that honor police. The most you get is a highway sign with your name on it. So, you know, and this is coming from, let me just give you some background. Um, you know, I, I'm an immigrant. I'm a minority. Um, I played, you know, the, uh, the NWA song, the famous one, if you're American, you know the one I'm talking about, you know, while I'm driving my car. And the reason that I still support the police is because its history is a little bit more easily explained. The police, of course, were the ones that supported Muhammad Ali when he was called Cassius Clay in Louisville, Kentucky. And that's an interesting story that a lot of people still don't know much about because it's got so much hype attached to it because Muhammad Ali was just such a unique individual. Um, one of the reasons, by the way, was it was Joe Martin a Louisville police officer that was able to protect and elevate and introduce Cassius Clay to the sport of boxing. Why? Well, first of all, Muhammad Ali was not poor at all. He was middle class. That's why he was so concerned about losing that expensive bike. Um, and one of the reasons that he was, his parents were able to afford that bike was because, I'm giving you some history, Kentucky, I think it was the state court that, you know, that passed a law allowing African Americans to own property Way, even during social segregation. So you could enforce separate but equal, but you couldn't have, you couldn't stop people from buying property. You were not able to financially discriminate you know, against African Americans on the basis of their race. You could not, you know, in, at least in that area, you, so, you know, could not be essentially try to bankrupt African Americans based on a law, which was done in many other places, you know, in, called redlining where you would essentially say, well, this area is off limits um, in terms of making a mortgage uh, to certain people, including at that time, African-Americans. Um, but in Kentucky, in, and especially in Louisville, you know, it's a really interesting place because you also have Hunter S. Thompson, perhaps the world's, America's, uh, you know, best political journalist, in, uh, you know, coming out of Louisville as well, a, a white guy. So... You have a situation with Muhammad Ali, getting back to him. Let's quickly go through that history because it's, it's essential to understand why we want to support the police and not necessarily the military, unless the military is engaged under a commander like General Eisenhower that sees both the upsides and the downsides of excessive military spending and influence. And so with Muhammad Ali, he's from middle class because he's, he's able to be from a middle class family because of a court decision that was made way before he was born that allowed Africans, uh, you know, African Americans within Kentucky the opportunity to own something and to be part of that community, despite separate but equal, despite having to take a separate bus or a separate tram or, and, and seated in different areas, despite you know, having to maybe even, I don't know if that's true, but maybe even a drink from separate water fountains. Um, and so they had a way of, of you know, gaining self-respect through property, which is really what the American dream has always been about. Muhammad Ali, because of that court decision, his parents were able to be middle class. His Christian parents are able to, are able to give him a bike, expensive one. He loses that bike. Joe Martin, a white police officer, is able to then take him to a boxing gym that is integrated, that is not subject to these social laws. It's integrated because it's part of the military. The military was, so Joe Martin was part of that, was running a gym that was used, that was in a building uh, that was used by people from the military. And the military, just for obvious reasons, has to be integrated, it's just, just you know, because it, it, you, it, it just, you can sort of think about how, why you wouldn't want uh, segregation on a large scale. 
uh, within the military if you have to rely on each other, you know, for your life. Um, even if you're in a separate unit, you would want equality in, in terms of skill set because you might be dependent on somebody else for your life at some point in the future. And so, you know, when you look at Louisville, you've got this police officer living under Jim Crow type law, social laws, but not property laws necessarily, who then is able to bring in Cassius Clay into a gym that is that has an integration. And that's how Muhammad Ali becomes Muhammad Ali. So you don't have, if you don't have the military, the police, in the cooperating on the same page in terms of this social nonconformity, which is really weird, right? Because what is the major complaint with police officers and, and military? They follow orders. That's why a few people who are nonconformists want to join either one, because we don't want to follow orders. And there's nothing, there's nothing really honorable about following orders, especially if those orders are unjust, as they were in Vietnam, as was pointed out by both Muhammad Ali and Martin Luther King. Christians as well, one Christian, one, one Muslim, and many other people as well. All those things had to be in place. The court decisions, uh, the police, and the military all together had to be in place in order for, Martin, for, for Muhammad Ali to come out of Louisville and could have only have happened in Louisville, Kentucky. When you set foot in Louisville, Kentucky, that is the only place in America that could have made a Muhammad Ali. Nowhere else. You, that's the beauty of having these systems working together on fundamentally progressive terms. This, because all of it was not was was nonconformist. All of it. The court decision did not sync up with a later, I think it was called Plessy versus Ferguson, later on. Out of Muhammad Ali becomes a nonconformist, comes out of their process to Vietnam. Everything he does is nonconformist because he's a product of the establishment's nonconformity as well on the state law level and, and on the local level. People who had to follow orders but found ways around it, including a police officer, not the military, although, of course, there's some overlap at that time. And that overlap today, I don't think it necessarily exists, unfortunately, except when it comes to hiring practices. You may, you may have, which is not, a, not necessarily a good thing, because once again, the military is expansionist on, a, on the international scale. Uh, one of the reasons that people died since Vietnam were, were, was not only to, because of this dichotomy between godless communists that we were told were going to come and, and drop nuclear bombs on us, um, and these upright Christians, um, you know, fighting for, you know, the, the way of freedom. It was a situation overall where, you know, you had to also protect the economies that were created, the economic alliances that were made after World War II, uh, that did in many cases depend on a supply, a consistent supply of oil, gas, at that time, rubber, tin. Um, there's even an Eisenhower letter. I mean, Eisenhower was extremely uh, ahead of his time, but that, that doesn't mean that he didn't make mistakes or that he did not think in America's uh, brutal self-interest. There's a, a, a situation there where he was actually helping fund projects in Vietnam to help advance it in part because the supply, he actually says, the supply of tin TIN is so essential uh, to the world economy. We can't let the communists get their hands on that because if they do, that'll actually disrupt the supply chain. Nobody used the word supply chain back then, but that's what they were talking about. They were talking about this economic alliance post-World War II that upheld prosperity and that, that not only upheld prosperity for the United States uh, based on many different things, um, you know, including for, you know, most favored nation status, but also... Um, you know, for Germany and Japan. And we know it worked. We know Eisenhower was right. We know that the people who died in World War II did not die in vain because today Germany and Japan are better off in many cases than the United States. And the very, very people that died for the United States to be able to spread its economic system and its values overseas. What's interesting, of course, is that neither Germany or Japan are particularly Christian or, you know, faithful in the traditional religious sense, which tells you right away that that rationale, she should be a little bit skeptical of that rationale. That's what was given to the people that's convinced them to go to war and kill somebody that they don't know. Now, let's go back to the police. That's originally why I started this discussion. There's no Memorial Day for the police. And most people 
when they grow up, they want to be police officers because it taps into that, which is commonly called as the mama bear instinct, where you want to protect the cubs. The people, you don't want a society where everyone gets a gun um, and walks out with a gun. That's not necessarily, we don't want to go back to the Wild West. And so there are bullies in the world and we have to stop them. Somebody has to stop them. And again, I don't want to be part of an organization that follows orders. So in some cases, I do depend on people that will follow orders. And the, so that's why when I, if I'm going to de depend on that, I want that, that agency to be local, to be something I can reach out and touch. And the only way you have a stable society is if you can not only reach out and touch the hat of the mayor at some point, you know, the representative that's supposed to listen to you because it, he's, he's beholden to you or she's beholden to you and not the national government somewhere in D.C. Uh, you want to be able to look at somebody with a police uniform and immediately think about respect because otherwise you're going to have noncompliance. In other words, you want to be a nonconformist, but not in, 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 in interaction with a police officer because the police officer is supposed to represent your interests in that community. And as a result, right, it's supposed to be given deference because of that connection to the local community. So the mama bear analogy does not really work if you think about the history of the military post-Vietnam. It does work and it's supposed to work with the police. The problem is that the police have lost credibility. Why was I able to play the NWA song, which is anti-police, and why are rappers in America so well known, uh, despite being anti-police? Because the fact of the matter is that because the police have their ear to the ground, you know, m much better than the national government, they also reflect the social atmosphere. And the social atmosphere in America for a long time has been racism against black people, segregation against black people. And remember, Muhammad Ali he was, was you know, successful because all these people that were supposed to follow orders did not follow orders, not to the letter. So, didn't do it in Iowa either when they were protecting, it was the police that protected people in Iowa, religious minorities in Iowa, uh, the Mennonites and the Amish who were pacifists, who would not fight in the war, is, is somewhat consistent. Those are the ones we know about. When the military shows up, in California, they take people to the camps, the internment camps, the Japanese. They round them up and they put them in camps. When the German military shows up in Germany, they round up the Jews. They send them, send them a notice, come by, report, put them on a train. They go down to the camps. They're beholden to an international order, not to the local order. So, the, now, why has the credibility of the police been damaged? Because the police reflect back onto you your culture, at least a part of it. And this is something that has to change. And if it doesn't change, we're all in trouble because the most important community member of any city or any county is an honest police officer. It's also a journalist, by the way, you know, because if there's corruption, you want to you have a leak that can go out and reform. So it's, it's not just one person, right? It's always an ecosystem that's supposed to maintain integrity while protecting the whistleblowers. And that's where we have knowledge that allows us to, uh, you know, be able to reform and make things better. And of course, you know, you've got a situation here where the police have lost credibility, which is not the fault necessarily of the police. It's the fault of a long line of, you know, orders regarding segregation, a lot of economic issues, and the police reflect that back to us. And the real question here is, how do, we have to have a society where the police are able to, you know, build up credibility so the, so the country can function again. And this is important because I think most people in America realize that the national government in D.C. is broken. It's completely corrupt. About uh, two-thirds of the budget is already pre-allocated. So, so really when people make all these debates and grandstand um, at the podium, at most they only have control to, of about a third of the purse, of the taxpayer purse or the debt purse. Uh, that allows them to change anything. Um, and so it wouldn't necessarily be a problem if you are able to go to a city with an honest police officer, an honest police force, because, because you still have a situation where you have a chance. Because it wasn't as if Muhammad Ali in Louisville, Kentucky, was born during a time when the national government was doing the right thing, or that, that it wasn't corrupt. If anything, it was more corrupt than the one we have now, because we're not in a Vietnam now. But Muhammad Ali still came out of there. Black people were still able to buy homes despite discriminatory laws. 
You were still able to build up equity and be a part of that community. Why? Because you had, obviously, you had an honest police force. You had Joe Martin and everybody else. Now, things have changed. How do we know they've changed? Joe Martin, the same person who made Muhammad Ali, ran for election in Louisville and somewhere in Kentucky. Did not win. He ran as a Democrat. Did not win. I don't know if that's because of gerrymandering. I don't know what happened. But we know things have changed. If a guy like Joe Martin, a police officer, can't win an election in Louisville, Kentucky. So when we think about these issues, and one of the reasons why I'm, and now I'm in Singapore. Singapore has probably the world's most honest police force. Why? It's diverse. Um, you know, it draws from all corners of society here in Singapore and the city state. And if I see somebody in this country with a police officer's uniform, I immediately feel safe because this country has no history of the police going after it because it's also a diverse police. It's deliberately designed to be a, a diverse police force with Muslims, Christians, all the people, Tamils, everybody here, um, you know, it's, it's, it's completely diverse. The military, even though it has a, a mandatory draft, is not as much. And that's actually why Singapore is able to have such a, an honest and diverse police force, because the fact of the matter is the military can always shut down the police. And so the military in this country, you know, based on the structure that the founder came up with, um, you know, actually will all, will be, will may, not, may not be as diverse. Um, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, the military here, uh, despite a strong alliance with the United States, is not going out and trying to invade other countries or to use its, its disproportionate power in the region for military adventurism. So, the, you know, if I see somebody here with a military uniform, you know, it's, okay, they're, they're typically young, they're going through a draft, um, they're in the draft, right? It's a mandatory, uh, I don't know how many years uh, they have to serve, but uh, there's a minimum n number of years. Um, but here, you know, so I'm sort of like, you know, okay, that, that's fine. It's something you had to do, okay? Um, it's not the same feeling I see here if I see somebody with a police uniform. If I see somebody in a police uniform here, the, even though I've got nothing to do with it, I feel a sense of pride because this is the most honest police force in the world here. And it's also diverse, and that's one of the reasons why people can trust it. That's not the case in the United States because in many cases there's overlap between the KKK, uh, because of the segregation situation in the, in, the, in the United States, both de facto and de jure, both by law and informally and in fact. Uh, and so the police, of course, you know, you listen, you look at what's going on in the United States where you have a lot of people that are making citizens arrests with guns. Actually, that's, that's, part, of a, that's part of the culture that was, was handed down because through the police in order to keep people in their place. And you... You have to, in America, if you're an immigrant, if you're somebody or even just somebody who cares about your country in the United States, you cannot expect successful people to stay there if they have to deal with both a corrupt local police force and a corrupt national government. You have to have one or the other. Once you have a, both corrupt, it's time to go. Find somewhere else if you can. Because it's just a straight shot down when the people in authority are not, not only have to have to follow orders, but when you have that kind of corruption on both levels, there's no barrier. There's no real checks and balances. We've seen that now under, under the Trump administration where the courts keep actually ruling in favor of Trump sometimes. But even, in, even when they don't, even when, say, a lieutenant general pleads guilty, the president just pardons the guy or tells the DOJ, the federal agency responsible for prosecutions, to drop the lawsuit. Now, the prosecution. Now... I mean, I, I should probably stop here, but, but, you know, I mean, I had another point. I forgot it. Um, but, you know, you, you, there is a situation where we have to start thinking about local versus national uh, a little bit more intelligently. And it's not as if, you know, obviously the military has more, more money. And part of that is because, you know, the federal government has a printing press. The states and, and, and well, sorry, cities and counties, they have to at least have a balanced budget, um, which means they have some limits. And, but that's not, again, that's not really the reason, you know, for, you know, the, the local, that's one of the links between the local, you know, sort of city and county and the local police department. But it's not the, it's not the main link, right? It's just, you know, the revenue will, will still come. And in fact, it's not as if anybody, most police departments are not underfunded. Um, you know, in most cities in America, whether it's big or small, about half, 50 to 70 percent of the budget goes to uh, the police. Now, unfortunately, it's, it's it's a little harder to figure out exactly in some cities and counties you know, where that money goes from the budget. 
uh, because in many cases, like in San Jose, for example, at least on the pie charts, the most easily accessible, you know, uh, data, it, it combines police and firefighters. Um, and so it's, you have to sort of flesh it out under public safety. And, and you know, nobody's got, no one has anything against firefighters, right? But, you know, you do want to be in a situation where you, you can be transparent, where, you know, I don't have to fly to a city somewhere in order to figure out what's going on in that city, to figure out the, the accountability in that city, the procedures for the police auditor, and so on. You want to be in a position where, you know, you are able to figure out, this, you know, just by looking at the data, the number of police reports, you know, the number of um, people in the police department that have been, um, you know, that have had to leave because they've committed a, a, a violation or excessive force. Uh, we don't actually have that level of transparency. There's nothing that shows what's called a 1981 or a 1983 civil rights lawsuit for excessive force. We don't have that. We have some on the financial side. The United States has done a pretty good job putting a lot of financial data for governments online. But there hasn't been anybody who's been visionary, right? There hasn't been any people that have been able to sort of apply transparency methods completely to be able to figure out how to get um, a better picture, uh, one of which would include some sort of, you know, police auditor and police report um, and oversight commission data together, along with the financial data. Um, and, you know, to figure out when a police officer gets fired from this place after an investigation, does that police officer simply go work for private security or are they actually in a position where they are able to transfer based on this national union network to a different police department and thereby, you know, create essentially a lack of accountability. Now, one, one of the things that has also has to be fixed, in, you know, in addition to this sort of basic transparency that is no, that is no longer sufficient because a lot of laws have been passed that actually protect, um, you know, the records of individual police officers. Um, under privacy laws, under state constitutions. So we have to sort of get up to, if that's, if that's going to be the case, um, then we have to actually create more transparency, but in a different way. We can anonymize the data from the police audit, no, independent auditor, but we have to find a way of actually trying to create a, more, a better way of judging whether or not the local police department is in fact um, not only transparent, but also honest and effective, especially if you're spending 50 to 70% of your budget on that. Now, thereby taking money away from a lot of other opportunities, uh, whether it's social welfare, whether it's a community center, and so on. Now, the, one of the biggest problems with this, why the police have lost credibility, is, ironically, is a lack of legalization of the drug trade, uh, so, which gives police a lot of discretion. And if you give people a lot of discretion, they tend to use it. Uh, and so if you're going to do that, you have to have the highest level, the highest functioning people you possibly can. The more discretion you have, the better your employees have to be. That's just not the case in police departments in the, in the United States. Anyway, it is here. That's why I, I feel safe in Singapore. And, and, you know, whenever I come here, I don't have to, you know, they're, they're actually, you don't have to worry about those things here. Uh, part of it, of course, it's a small place. But, you know, because it's small, there's no segregation. There can't be. And there's public transportation as well. Uh, but also, that's not the only part of it, right? You know, people in the police departments will say, we don't start out being racist, but the longer we are on this job, the more we're exposed to the social inequities that, you know, that we see. And when maybe some of us don't understand the history, but the ones that do understand the history understand that's a product of racial segregation, specifically Jim Crow and other elements um, within our society that have led to a disproportionate number of, amount of crime happening in these areas, which also tend to overlap with perhaps a specific racial group. What I just said is like, you know, weird, right? Nobody talks that way, but it's the truth. Um, if you're exposed to a certain, you know, area every single day now, and, and part of that is actually based on statistics. Um, you know, in, in the United States, 70%, these numbers, about 67%, um, you know, of the people that are sent to jail re-offend. So the, the rehabilitation programs don't work. I'm not surprised. Um, the jail system in the, in the U.S. is once again, you know, a product of that segregation of trying to control people from the other side of the tracks. It's not designed to rehabilitate. It's something you're putting on. It's a layer that you're adding on top of a system that wasn't designed to do what you're trying to do. Uh, so that's why it's failed. Uh, but also as the educational system has failed, um, if you're able to be in that position. And furthermore, uh, you know, in addition to that, we have, you know, it's called recid I can't even pronounce it, recidivism, um, you know, you have another situation where 70% of the children of criminal uh, convicts also end up in jail. 
Well, at least, yeah, they end up convicted. I'm not sure if they also end up in jail. I don't know if it's the misdemeanor or a felony. But, you know, so you got to be a little careful about, about statistics. But you can see how there's a cycle involved, which would explain the segregation and everything else. Which would also explain why police officers in the U.S. are more careful when dealing with people from the other side of the tracks. Because you still have that, you know, that line of segregation that's, you know, then, you know, manifested in, in, in essentially disparate government spending um, or unequal or unequitable government spending, which then, of course, you know, creates a disincentive for the private sector to also invest in the area. Next thing you know, on the other, other side of the tracks, you've got your liquor stores and your laundromats. And then on the other side, you've got your tech companies. And they're only 15 minutes away from each other by car. So the police reflect back to you what the, the culture of your own country. If you have a culture of segregation and racism, you know, people might not be able to be all fancy and explain it in the way that I've explained it. Uh, they might just end up, you know, it's, it's there. And that has consequences. You don't even have to, you know, I mean, it has obvious consequences. One of the ways of fixing that as well is because one of the reasons we have problems is because the lack of legalization of drugs has also created a vice squad uh, within police departments that is essentially untouchable because it's, it's, it recruits sometimes from criminals. Um, and, the same, you know, and so once you have that scenario, in order to go undercover and co-opt or infiltrate gangs and other entities in order to gain intelligence. And a lot of that is done not by, say, the FBI, but it's done um, by police departments. So you have this sort of schism, this dichotomy between people that are generally honest, the ones that are patrolling your streets, the ones that are you know, wearing the uniform, um, and, and then you have this other side that's hidden that I'm not even sure mayors know about, um, you know, even though they're technically supposed to be the executive in charge of the police department. Uh, but, you know, with throwing all these union rules that remove accountability, and, and it's quite possible. Obviously, there's no transparency, right? Same thing as a black budget CIA situation where, uh, you know, there's a black box where you don't know what the hell is going on. Um, and, you know, you, you don't, and you also have an opportunity where the police officers can become corrupt, <clears throat> You know, because either the funding is not consistent um, or they, they're just unaccountable because they're part of that vice squad and they're, they're essentially, they got they got a get out of jail free card. And I'm not saying that everyone in vice is bad. I think, that, you know, it's a necessary, if you, if you make things illegal, thereby giving the black market operators an incentive to enter that economic zone, then guess what? You're going to have to infiltrate them. You're going to have to co-opt them somehow to know what's going on in order to protect people um, from those actors. This has been going on for a long time. It's nothing new. Miami, at one point, you know, one of the, <laughs> look at what happened to Miami during recessions back, back in the 70s and 80s. Um, they were still doing well. The banks had too much money. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was a situation, I mean, you can go back and look at, look at all those other, other aspects to realize it's not the police that's, that are necessarily the primary focus or the primary catalyst for these inequities and for a lot of the other problems in society. Um, they happen to be the, the ones that are, that are similar, operating in a capacity similar to a messenger where they're the ones that get put on camera for dealing with the results of all these other economic policies and social policies that are under the, guy, uh, under the jurisdiction of politicians, lawyers, and educators, and professors to come up with these policies. In the military, it's the same thing. You know, if you talk to people in the military, they will say, look, we follow orders. We're not civilians. It's the commanders you want to talk to. Um, and, you know, what do you want us to do? You know, uh, you know uh, so, you know, <laughs> we are also the result of policy making. Why are you treating us differently uh, than when we wear a uniform than when the police wear a uniform? Well, the difference, of course, is that what I just described, which is that, you know, only between these two agencies, only one of them is designed to be local. That's why you don't have just a military. You could technically just open up an outpost, military outpost in every city in America. Why don't you do that? They have guns too. They know how to use guns. Why not? Well, the reason you don't do that is because you want these checks and balances. You want these different sources of, sources of law enforcement. When you travel, it becomes even more obvious, right? Some places have the police, the military, and then tourist police. So even if the local police are corrupt, if you're a tourist, you feel safe traveling there because then you go to the tourism police, which is funded by taxes from you. Hey, there's that local link again, almost like it means something. So the military, when you consider the history of military adventurism since Vietnam, but not before that, uh, but since Vietnam, you are not in, a, in the military organization as a whole, not just, not just the 
military eventualism, right? That's also a product of a lack of accountability on the financial side. I don't think there's been a, a proper audit of the Pentagon in, in decades, even well, actually ever, perhaps. Um, I remember seeing, you know, we've all seen the shows where, you know, the military purchased something like a shower curtain for $200. Um, but, you know, that, that again goes back to a lot of just such a, anything, anytime something gets too big, there's going to be problems. The question is, what percentage of, of problems are those? Because you can, you can nitpick anything, any organization, anywhere. Um, but the problem with the military is they don't get the benefit of the doubt. Because, again, military adventurism since Vietnam. Which they lost. The, the commanders. So, the vice squad has to, be, has to be reformed, which is almost impossible to do because it's not transparent. So how do you fix that? You legalize whatever is under your jurisdiction, and you co-opt it legally, just like we just like we did with the, just like America did with the mob in Las Vegas. We put them into structures, and, and the same thing with the IRA and, and you know, another organization, criminal organization uh, that used violence, right? The mob and so on. And, and we, we we had Sinn Fein. You had you know all these organizations. Once you make them part of the political structure, it's a lot harder to run a government than it is to run an opposition movement. That's typically how you defang all these movements. And with a vice squad, it's going to be really difficult to do it from within because they're literally designed to not have any transparency. And if you can't have transparency, you don't have checks and balances, you can't really get in to figure out who's good, who's bad, and what do you do at that point? But if you legalize these sorts of issues, one of the problems pe you know, people have is, well, look at the mafia. Do, we, do you really want a situation where the mafia suddenly gets more money? Uh, and you know, it's not necessarily true. If things become legal, prices might go down. Anyway, that, that's speculative. You know, we're dealing with something else at that point. But the fact of the matter is, one of the reasons you know, we know vice has failed is because the mafia is still as strong as ever. Um, you know, it's not like the, these sort of illegal activities have gone away. If anything, they've gone up in value overall. Um, and so if we're spending all this money on a division within police departments that is not necessarily doing anything to improve the situation in health and safety, and in, in, in that failure over a long period of time is impacting the credibility of the beat cop who is an honest person or the detective who is honest and who needs information to do his or her job more effectively and now is having a harder time going across the track to do his or her job more effectively because of what's happening on the other side of his own department or her own department. What do we do at that point? We have, but at least now we know the issues and so we can try to fix it so that one day a U.S. citizen like myself can go to my own country and look at somebody in a uniform and feel the same kind of pride that I feel when I look at somebody, a police officer in Singapore with a similar uniform.